Well, a very good morning to one and all who have joined us on this broadcast viewing channel this morning. It's a great pleasure to have you join us as we engage in the Word of the Lord for our hearts this morning. My name is Randolph Barnwell and I'm the Senior Minister of Gate Ministries Durban Central. It's our great pleasure to have you join us this morning. This represents our seventh session in our exploration of what we titled Passover Principles. And these are principles that we are exploring using Israel as a case study in terms of how they exited 430 years of Egyptian slavery, celebrated a Passover feast, and journeyed towards a promised land. And so what we have been doing in recent weeks is decoding the principles relative to the celebration of the Passover feast. We also have been looking at what Egypt represents. Uh, symbolically, what was the nation of Israel coming out of? What was God releasing them from? And we have explored various principles in reference to the nature of Egypt and sought to isolate a contemporary counterpart to those principles. And what I would really encourage you is to review and look back at the past seven sessions in the current series for you to get a more accurate, complete and holistic view of what Egypt represents. You must remember that the scripture says everything written in reference to Israel, particularly their exodus from Egypt and their wilderness journeys and entrance into the promised land, it was specifically recorded for yours and for my learning so that we can learn from mistakes they made and hopefully not make those same mistakes in pursuing our maturation in sonship and capacity to attain all the purposes of God relative to our lives. So this morning we're going to continue. I'm going to ignore the temptation to rehearse on, on items we've discussed prior to this. And I want to get straight into today's focus. In last week, I discussed the representation of Egypt as that context or condition that incites us to murmur and to grumble. I then did with you an appraisal and analysis of Israel's murmurings, their grumblings, and how that in Paul's mind, amongst many other factors, ranked as a, a primary factor that prevented their entrance into their promised land. Now, today, I'm going to talk about a related issue, and it concerns the issue of bitterness. So I want to deal with Egypt's representation as that context which by its bondage, by its limitation, by its enslavement, will tend to inculcate a spirit of bitterness in sons of God, out from which they must come if they're going to pursue maturity in sonship and their prophetic inheritance in terms of accomplishing specific aspects of God's will or God's assignment that is attendant with their lives. Now, I want to kick off by reading a verse of scripture in Exodus chapter 1 from verses 13 and 14. The Bible says the following, The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. And they made their lives bitter. Now notice the emphasis of the words. The Egyptians made the lives of the sons of Israel, the sons of God, bitter. With hard labor in mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field. All their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. So most certainly, Israel represents that culture, that context, those sets of conditions, mindsets, mentalities, if you would, that seek to make us susceptible 
to accepting a condition of bitterness within, accommodating that state within us. And if you and I are not careful, that condition of bitterness is going to seriously prevent you and I from attaining fullness in sonship, fullness in our maturity in sonship, and seriously impede our capacity to do God's will with any kind of effectiveness in Christ. So I want to encourage you for today's session and probably in the next session, I want to thoroughly deal by the leading of the Lord with the issue of bitterness out from which you and I have to come. And you might conclude, but Randolph, I'm not a bitter person. Now, I want to challenge you and I that I believe that by the Holy Ghost's leading to lead me to prosecute this matter, that perhaps there is residual bitterness in you and I that God wants to thoroughly extricate, thoroughly expunge and release you and I from any residual or remnant hold that bitterness has within our hearts. Now, in my prior broadcast, I spoke to you about the seriousness of the condition of murmuring or complaining. Now, complaint speech, speech that tends to murmur, has a root somewhere. And biblically, complaint is rooted in bitterness. People only complain because the speech gives indication of a much more serious condition of the heart which is a bitter heart. The Bible says, for example, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if your mouth is speaking, for example, um, complaint or murmur of the murmur, fault finding, critical speech, etc. Usually that is symptomatic or indicative of a much more serious issue. And I want to suggest to you and I today that that serious issue, that serious condition, is a lethal condition of a bitter heart or bitterness. Now Job 7 and verse 11 proves this. And it says the following, Therefore I will not restrain my mouth. Remember last week I spoke to you about the need to restrain our mouths, to regulate our speech, so that we don't incessantly complain. Now Job says, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. And I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. So here is conclusive proof that unrestrained speech emanates from the bedrock of a bitter soul. So you cannot correct the speech without curing the soul. If the soul is bitter, it will spew bitter speech. It will spew complaining speech. It will, it will be constantly murmuring. So bitterness of the soul leads to complaint in you and I through our mouths. Secondly, bitterness in soul causes anguish of spirit. Notice what Job says. He said, I will speak in the anguish of my spirit and I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Now, you are spirit, soul and body, as I've taught before. It's always God's uh, will that sons of God operate from the authority of a word-informed, grace-laced spirit. Your spirit must be full of grace, full of the principles of God's word, under the leadership and direction of the Holy Spirit. From that spirit-enriched place, you can then direct and lead your soul to obey God in your body. But now when your soul, for example, is perplexed by bitterness, what bitterness, unchecked bitterness in the soul does, it starts to rival the place, the God-ordained place of your spirit to, to lead your life, to direct your body in obedience to the Lord. 
So based on this verse, I can only conclude that a bitter soul leads to anguish of spirit and will result in unrestrained, uncontrolled spewing forth of complaining and of, of murmuring. And I think it's God's ordering for the fact that we are addressing these issues now. I think it's God's intent to deliver you and I from unrestrained murmuring speech. But like I say, to correct that, you need to correct a much more serious issue. And that issue is a bitter soul. Now, in Job chapter 10 and verse 1, he said this, I loathe my life. I will give full vent to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. So, complaint that is not cured seeks to vent itself. Notice his wording. He said, I will give full vent to my complaint. So, full vent literally means undisciplined, unrestrained, uh, venting forth of the dissatisfaction, discontentment of a bitter soul. And secondly, I wrote in my notes, complaint is simply an expression of a bitter heart. And then thirdly, complaint is a sign of bitterness. So it's indicative of the fact that if you're incessantly complaining, if you are a, a grumbler, uh, at every turn you find reason for which to complain and to perhaps fault find and to be involved in critical speech that is not constructive, if your whole intent is to demean another by, by the content of your conversation, this evidences that in you there is a residual bitterness that is unchecked, uncured. So if you cure the bitterness of the soul, you can cure the content of the speech. If the soul is cured, the, the words of our mouths will therefore be far more gracious and far more healthful. The words we speak will bring healing to others. But nobody who leaves bitterness unchecked in their soul can ever hope to speak gracious words, words of hope, words of edification, words of comfort, and words of grace to a world that so desperately needs it. So complaints in your mouth reveal the bitterness of the, of the heart. Now, you can deny the fact that you are bitter. You can argue the fact, but Randolph, I'm not bitter. I certainly am not a bitter person. From what I know of myself, most definitely me, I'm not bitter. And you, you can say that, you can argue that. But an expressed, incessant, complaining speech is proof that bitterness resides in the heart. So I want to challenge everyone. I know that many of you have been challenged from the last two broadcasts when we dealt with grumbling versus groaning. And we've received many reports, many testimonies of how the Word has really challenged you. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, with your cooperation, with His intent to heal you of these things, that every single one of us, you and I, are making headway and we are maturing and we're getting victory over the content of our words. I really pray that this is our experience. So, and I pray that over the next two broadcasts, as we deal with some of the root issues that give rise to complaint speech, that God, by His Spirit, is going to cure us from any residual, any remnant bitterness within, within our hearts. Now, notice what Job says here in Job, in Job 10 verse 1. He said, I loathe my life. I will give full vent to my complaint. And I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Notice his words, I loathe my life. 
Now, obviously, the Lord permitted a very serious trial to befall Job. Okay, all his kids are dead. His entire material wealth is stripped from him. And even his physical health, he's struck with boils from head to toe. More, moreover, he has a wife that certainly doesn't understand why, how, why God has permitted this level of trial in their lives. And he says, I loathe my life. In other words, I am dissatisfied. I am discontented. I will prove to you, perhaps in the next broadcast, how that one of the roots of bitterness is unmet needs. Unmet needs must not lead you to become a bitter person. It will tend to unhappiness. And Job says, I loathe my life because it is a far cry of the state of external blessedness that my life once knew. So I have been downgraded to this level of existence. And I utterly despise, the word loathe means to despise and to detest. So bitterness and subsequent complaint, bitterness and the subsequent or the resultant complaint is rooted in severe unhappiness or dissatisfaction about the status or the quality of your life or welfare. Now, many of you can look at your life presently and say, I loathe my life presently. I want to encourage you, and unfortunately, you're going to have to wait until the next broadcast, where I will teach you the art of contentment, the art of being absolutely content with what God permits in you to test you, to try you, to, to bring out a level of maturation within you, but never come to the place like Israel where they despised even the manna. They even despised the quality and the level of God's provision within their experience. So I want to challenge you that we're going to heal our bitterness. We're going to heal our complaining. God's going to heal our murmuring. But He has to heal the bitterness that drives the murmur. You don't address the symptom. Address the root cause. And the symptom will automatically disappear. Now, let's get back to the Passover. If, is, if Egypt, like I said, represents that context that incites or incites or that makes one susceptible to become bitter, uh, to become unhappy, to loathe present existence, to become utterly distraught, discontented, and it's manifest, like I said, in murmuring, if that is Egypt's representation, then when God instructed them to come out, and before they could come out, they had to celebrate the Passover feast, which for you and I simply means they had to observe certain principles which would facilitate their safe exodus out from Egypt and also their safe passage in journeying toward their promised land. So they would slaughter a, an innocent, spotless uh, lamb of at least one year old, sprinkle its blood on the lintels and the doorposts, and in the house under the leadership of the father of the house, sit at a table, eat the meat, the lamb, after roasting it, eat it, and they would also eat unleavened bread and also bitter herbs. Now let me read the text for you. It's Exodus chapter 12 and verse 8. It reads thus, They shall eat the flesh that same night, that is the actual lamb, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So there were three things to be consumed. The lamb, the meat, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. Now why would God put, as part of the menu, so to speak, at the Passover meal, why, why spice it up, in inverted commas, with bitter herbs? Why include 
bitter herbs as part of the meal. Now, many theologians are in agreement that bitter herbs were included to remind the Israelites of the bitter oppression of Egyptian slavery. Remember, in Israel's history, at the first Passover and beyond, throughout successive generations, this Passover feast would be celebrated. It would be enacted generationally throughout the years that, that followed. So every time a family would eat, and let's say a child would ask, what are the bitter herbs for? The father would then say, this was the bitterness, a reminder of the bitterness instilled in the nation in 430 years of, of Egyptian slavery. But the bitter herbs, although you might argue, but then why internalize it in a meal? Why take something bitter and internalize it in a meal? You see, the bitter herbs were not eaten alone. They were consumed along with unleavened bread and the lamb. Right? Unleavened bread and the lamb. And both the principles represented by the unleavened bread and the lamb was precisely to arrest the effect of bitterness indicated symbolically by the bitter herbs. So what, do, what does the lamb represent and what does unleavened bread represent? represent. Now, bread, as you know, is a specific reference to God's word. Man will not live by bread alone, Matthew 4.4, 4, Luke 4.4, 4, but by every word that comes from God's mouth. So bread in the meal is a definite reference to doctrine, to the word of God. Um, unleavened bread is a reference to doctrine that is pure. Doctrine that is accurate. Doctrine that is true. Now Jesus said this in Matthew 16 from verse 11 and 12. Please listen. It says, How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? Be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes. Then they understood that he did not say, Beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of of the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees. So here in Matthew, the reference of Jesus to the leaven of the Pharisees and scribes, he explains, is a reference to the teaching of the Pharisees and scribes. So leaven is a definite reference to doctrine, to teaching. Now, leaven is hist, as you know. And, and his basically is a little bit of sourdough, small little piece of yeast or sourdough that is put in the bigger batch of dough when bakers bake bread, for example. Um, so the small sour yeast put in the larger batch. And what, what happens is that yeast insidiously, secretly penetrates the entirety of of the dough okay so for example you will find verses like galatians 5 9 which says a little leaven level leavens the whole lump of the dough and there's a this is a very famous theological saying a little leavens a little leaven leavens the the lump so what is small in terms of its imp of its size is not small in terms of its impact. A little leaven can leaven a lump. A little bit of yeast, sourdough, in a batch of large dough insidiously works its way throughout the larger batch. Now, Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the teaching or the doctrine of the Pharisees and scribes. At the Passover feast, they ate unleavened bread. In other words, bread with no yeast, bread with no contaminant, bread with no virus in its system, bread with no inaccuracy, bread or truth or doctrine founded upon the accuracy of God's word. And I believe 
This would be a reference to pure apostolic doctrine. Later on in the series, I will deal with five or six expressions of what the scripture calls leaven. But for today's study and because of the brevity of time, I just want to bring to bear, to your remembrance, that unleavened bread is pure word. It's pure doctrine. It's, it's publicly accurate principles that are baked in apostolic culture, determined by authentically approved apostles of Christ. The lamb then that is eaten would represent Christ. Now, when they ate the lamb, the eating of the lamb was basically a symbolic picture of internalizing the nature and the principles of Christ. The eating of the lamb is to internalize the very essence of everything that Christ represents. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and the latter part of verse 7, says this, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Christ, our Passover. He is our Passover, our Passover lamb. So Israel ate the lamb at the Passover feast, symbolically saying, we ascribe to, we agree and accept the need to internalize all the, the, the characteristics and the nature of Christ as the lamb into our lives. How will we do that? We will do it by unleavened bread, by understanding, listening to, and obeying the principles of God's word accurately interpreted by authentic apostles. When you have these two components in your system, so the way in which I internalize the lamb is by eating the bread. And when I, by accurate doctrine, and by the nature of Christ, internalize these two in me. Those two components in me will arrest any capacity of the bitter herbs, the bitterness of life that I have to confront, the, the unleavened bread and the lamb, accurate doctrine and the nature of Christ in me will prevent me from being impacted negatively by the bitterness of life's circumstances. So I want you to get this picture. A, a family sits at a table to celebrate the Passover meal. And here you have unleavened bread, pure doctrine. Here you have the lamb, which is the nature and the principles of Christ, his characteristics. And here you have bitter herbs. And these two components, the unleavened bread and the lamb itself, the nature of the lamb, are designed to arrest any contaminant effect of bitterness in yours and my and my life. Okay, in yours and in my life. So I want to encourage you that the way to deal with bitterness is through the internalization of the nature of the lamb. Now, in a later broadcast, I will discuss specific aspects of the nature of the Lamb at the Passover feast. But for now, it references the entirety of everything Jesus is. Whatever He is like, you must become. As He is, so are we in this present world. And I will prove to you in a second that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. When he said, I am the way, he's not just saying, I'm the pathway to the Father. He's not just saying, I'm the access point to the Father. All these things are true. But when he said, I am the way, he's saying, my life is a pattern, is a methodology for all sons of God to emulate. If you look at how I lived as a son of man, being the Son of God in human flesh, my life is a template, it's a standard, um, it's a point of reference, it's a beacon, it's, it's, it's copyable. Look at my life and you can live a successful life if you simply study me because my life will show you the, the way. Now, I want to demonstrate to you how that Jesus himself, in his 33 and a half year life on the earth, 
experienced so much, yet not once fell prey to complaint or to bitterness. And yet he had so much reason to be bitter, and yet he did not fall prey to it. Because he, the lamb, the lamb component in you and I is going to be our immunity. It's going to be the antidote to the poison of bitterness. When bitterness seeks to come in, what bitterness must meet in you is the standard of the Lamb's nature in you. And bitterness will be arrested immediately. You can have the nature of the Lamb of God in you because you've subscribed to unleavened bread, to pure doctrine. Because it's by your your engagement, your obedience, your meditation upon pure doctrine that the nature of the Lamb is actually transmitted, established, and inculcated in in you. I want to say it again. When bitterness attempts to reside in you, what it must meet in you are two standards. A standard of accurate doctrine. And that will naturally tend to and produce the standard of the nature of Jesus, the Lamb of God, in you. So I want to just just to explain this a bit further, demonstrate to you now how that Jesus was never embittered. Now we're going to have to start in Genesis chapter 3, wherein there's a prophecy in reference to Christ, and not just Christ, but to the body of Christ as well. So Genesis 3 verse 15 is a prophecy that God echoed to Eve, the woman who fell together with her husband, Adam. Notice the wording of the Lord. God said to her, I will put enmity between you and the woman. I beg your pardon. This is a prophecy to Satan in reference to how he will engage the woman and the seed of the woman. And notice the particular framing of this. I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman. Between your seed and her seed your offspring and her offspring. He, her offspring, he will bruise your head and you will bruise him on the heel. Now, I will put enmity between you, Satan. This is God speaking to Satan. I will put enmity between you and the seed of the woman. Okay, the seed of the woman is going to bruise your head but as his heel bruises your head, you will bruise his heel. Now the seed of the woman referred to here is definitely a reference to Christ. And this can be proven. But it's also a reference to the body of Christ, to you and I. Because whatever attends Christ attends us as the, the body of Christ. Romans chapter 16 verse 19 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, under my feet. So while the seed of the woman, which is Christ, and remember Jesus in his death, when he was crucified on the cross of Calvary, dealt a death blow to Satan's authority and power. And to the entirety of the demonic world, Colossians says, that he made an open spectacle of Satan and demonic hosts in his death on the cross, and he triumphed over Satan. That was a fulfillment of this prophecy. Jesus in his death tramped the head of, this, of the serpent, Satan. This prophecy came to pass. But there are aspects of the victory of Christ on the cross that you and I as the church have got to experientially put into, put into practice. And so Romans 16, 19 says the God of peace will crush Satan under our feet, under your and my feet. The final enemy to be defeated would be the enemy of, of, of death. Now, Jesus in his death and in his life, demonstrated victory over any satanic attempt of Satan to bruise him. Notice the prophecy said that the seed of the woman will crush Satan's head, but Satan will bruise his heel or his foot. 
Now, the foot speaks of your walk. The foot speaks of, and when I say walk, the term walk in the New Testament refers to the entirety of one's life. For example, scriptures say, walk worthy of your calling in Christ Jesus. Let's watch how we walk. So it refers to how we behave, the entirety of how we live. It's our manner of life. Okay, And what Satan wants to bruise is how we walk, how we engage, Okay, how we live out life. Walking also denotes one's capacity to move with, with momentum or to make progress in your capacity to fulfill purpose. Okay, your capacity to fulfill purpose. Now, it's those two aspects that Satan wants to bruise. Wants to bruise or affect negatively your capacity to accurately live behaviorally in your life as God's representation as his son. And secondly, he wants to seriously impact your ability to effect God's purpose. So how does Satan bruise you? How does he bruise your heel? Now, you are spirit, soul, and body. When you get saved, your spirit is renewed. Your body is waiting for its redemption. So the body is waiting to be saved. And that will only happen when Christ returns, when this mortal, this, this, this mortal body will put on immortality. Paul says this corruptible body will put on incorruptibility and will be changed in a moment from mortality into immortality. So we spirit, soul, and body, the spirit, when we were saved and born again, has become renewed, regenerated in Christ Jesus. The body awaits final redemption, but the soul is that area of our mind, our will, and our emotions that is constantly being renovated and renewed day by day as we mature in Christ. Now, it's in that area of the soul where Satan mostly attacks us. Satan does attack us in our bodies through illness and or through death, for example. But most of, this, of Satan's attack is leveraged at the Son of God in the area of his soul. What's your soul? Your mind, how you think. right? Your will, how you decide. Your emotions, how you feel. And it's my understanding that the bruising of Satan, if he wants to inflict pain upon us, he does it most times in the soul area. Specifically the emotions of the soul, how you feel about yourself, about other people, about life, about circumstances. For example, depression would be a major satanic weapon. And that's the area of your, of your soul. The mind, how you view people, how you think, how you view life is a major area of satanic attack. Now, I want to encourage you. David was convinced in Psalm 23, David said these words, He restores my soul. The, 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 the great fight today is a fight for maturity in the area of your soul. The great battle takes place in the arena. The venue for spiritual warfare is a battle in the area of our soul. And often in the scripture, like the text we just read from Job 7 and Job 10, he speaks about, he vents his complaint in the bitterness of his soul. So if we can cure the bitterness of the soul, we will do well to moving towards a soul that is healthy, a soul that is whole. And let me just say this to you. The person that is of greatest value as an instrument to be used by God in the hands of God is a person whose soul is whole, is a person whose soul is healthy. Because it is in that area that Satan designs to bruise us to trip us up so that we don't think rightly as we should, don't decide correctly as we should. And, and importantly, we don't feel in terms of the emotive content of our lives as we should. Now, there are many sort of 
um, soul issues that need address. Unfortunately, we don't have time to talk to every one of them. But bitterness for me is a major issue of concern. I think bitterness is like the seedbed uh, that spawns and gives rise to a whole lot of other soul issues that need to be healed. For example, uh, bitterness give, gives rise to anger, and I'll prove to you later, to malice, to resentment, even to hatred, and even to unforgiveness. You can't correct those other issues until you correct the issue of, of a bitter soul. So Satan wants to bruise you. He can't bruise you in the area of your spirit man. He usually attacks you in the area of your soul and your body. But most of the inflictions and the bruisings take place in the area of your soul. And bitterness is a major bruising of Satan that you and I need total healing for. Now, in Luke 4 and verse 18, is a very well-known portion of Scripture. And Jesus said there that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Because he, the Spirit, has anointed Jesus... To, to preach the gospel, to set at liberty those that are bruised. It says a couple of other things, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, etc. But one of the things for which the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus for, the Bible specifically says, is to set at liberty those that are bruised. Now, notice the framing it's not to heal the bruised, it's to set the bruised free. It's to set at liberty those that are bruised. Now this obviously causes us to conclude then that a bruised person in the area of their soul is bound. Because Jesus said that you need, you need to be set free. And yes, you need to be healed, but you need to be set free because so long as you entertain bitterness, for example, or any other aspect of an area where your soul is bruised or hurt, in that area, not only are you unhealed, but you are not free too. And so Jesus said, I haven't come to heal the bruised. I've actually come to set the bruised at, at liberty. And later on, I'll prove to you how that if you entertain bitterness, you entertain captivity. That is why Egypt is so symptomatic and representative of bitterness. Because Egypt incarcerated Israel and bitterness keeps presently today sons of God locked up, um, confined. And you cannot explore what you know God is leading you into. You cannot uh, start to climb the rungs of maturity in Christ-like character because this thing in your soul always seems to draw you back. And let me just say this, the passage of time does not heal this kind of illness. I call it an illness because it is so. Time does not heal bitterness. It's going to take an anointing from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, the Spirit is upon me. And the text in Isaiah says, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke of any kind of bondage. And I want to encourage you as you listen, even as you listen, the Holy Spirit is breaking any residual bitterness in you. Even historically from your past, uh, there might be issues you've just swept to the Back, the back area of your mind and you've sectionalized no entry. I will not deal with that now. And you think by non-confronting it that time will heal it. I'm here to declare to you that because you are listening to this broadcast that God by the power of His Spirit is putting His spotlight on areas of your and my life that we need to focus on. Again, I challenge everyone listening the entirety of the church that I'm responsible for, and any other viewer, that because you've tuned in, I dare to say by the power of the Holy Spirit that God is saying to you, there are some areas that you might not be aware of where there might be residual bitterness in you 
that I, God, desires to heal. And I know that God is going to heal this. You're going to get over this. You're going to become a bitter, free person. Okay? You're going to become bitterless, not bitterful. And you're going to, from the position of being free from this, because Jesus said he came to set the bruised free, to set at liberty those that are, that are bruised. And let me just read to you a, a verse from Isaiah 42, from verses 1 to 3. This is a prophecy in reference to the Lord Jesus. And I, just, I need to read this to indicate to you the posture of Jesus right now to you and I. It says in verse 1 of Isaiah 42, Behold my servant, and my servant here is Christ Jesus that's being referred to. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will, be, he will faithfully bring forth justice. Now, it says here, a bruised stick or reed, Christ will not break. If you're feeling bruised, and let me just speak to while we are addressing bitterness specifically in this broadcast. You might be sitting there with a whole range of other emotional hurts in your life that may, may or may not be related to, to bitterness. You might be angry or resentful at some persons for whatever reason. And you might be feeling vulnerable in the area of your soul. You say to me, Randolph, there's a bruising there that God by the Holy Spirit is bringing to my remembrance now. I say to you, you will not be broken. You will not be a victim of Satan's bruising. Because the Lord says to you through his word, that a bruised reed, which is you, he will not break. There's a tenderness with which Christ through the Spirit comes to you this morning. And he says to you, my son, my child, my daughter, I'm here for you. I want you to heal you. I'm putting my spotlight on certain things because I want you totally free from the prison that you've allowed to be constructed for your soul such that you cannot fully engage my promises, my person, or my purposes for your life. And let me demonstrate to you how eligible the Lord Jesus is in delivering you from this, I said to you, He is the Lamb that you must internalize in your system. I said to you that He said, I am the way. Look at my life and see how I did it. Now, this afternoon I just sat and um, tried to pen down aspects in Jesus' life that could have made Him vulnerable to be a bitter person. It's my conviction that if there was any human in human history that had the greatest potential to be seriously affected with the poison and gall of bitterness, it would have been the man, Jesus Christ. By virtue of all the things he went through, if this was any other typical human being, it would have made this human being seriously bitter or have left the person with serious dysfunctionality in the area of their soul, their mind, their will, and their emotions. So, listen very, very carefully. Jesus went through the following things that could potentially make him bitter, but did not. And let me just say this to you, and you can relate, I'm just going to read them. You can relate to each one of these things in your life and see to what degree are you not allowing, permitting these things to make your heart bitter. Jesus was born so-called illegitimate, outside of marriage. He was unaccommodated for 
at his birth. There was no place at the end for him. He knew what it means to be rejected even at birth. He was the target of murder at his birth. Remember, Herod tried to, to kill him. He was frequently misunderstood in his motives. Why did he do the things that he did? He was misunderstood by family members. He was misunderstood by his own disciples. He was misunderstood by the entirety of the religious order of his day. How would you like where everything you do, your motives become questioned? His message was misunderstood. Not too many could, could easily understand him. His message was also misrepresented by some. He suffered rejection by his own people, the Jews. He came unto his own and his own did not receive him. He suffered rejection by those closest to him in the hour of his greatest need at his arrest. Many of his, of his disciples left him. He had numerous assassination attempts on his life during his three and a half year ministry period. I mean, how would you like to live life where at every turn someone is trying to kill you? And you know, murder for us from a New Testament perspective is defined as hatred. John says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. So many people try to murder Jesus physically. But now for you and I today, how would you like to live life where most people hate you? And this might be a revelation for some of you. Not everybody likes you. There are some people literally that hate you, that want to see you fail, want to see your demise. Jesus knew how to live life in a context where, where people literally hate him and want to and want to kill him. He often, Jesus often expressed dissatisfaction at the fact that his disciples were slow to learn and to apply his teachings in their lives. He, he would say words like, how, how long must I be with you, O you of little faith? He had, he had expectations on them by certain periods of their time, by virtue of how long they journeyed with him, that they would be at certain levels of maturation. And sometimes they just disappointed the Lord too often. He knew how to deal with these kinds of things. He never allowed any of these things I'm mentioning to embitter him. Okay? Also, Jesus had a mass exodus of people that left him as followers. After he fed the 5,000, which was literally about 15,000 people in total, because 5,000 not counting women and children, the Bible said they all followed him for the bread and the fish. And Jesus makes one doctrinal statement, that unless a man eats my flesh, drinks my blood, he has no part of me. And the Bible says they couldn't understand the statement, and they, they left him. And he was only left with the twelve. In one day, Jesus lost about 15,000 followers. I mean, how would you like to lose your 15,000 followers on Instagram? Or how would you, if you're administrating a WhatsApp group, 15,000 leave the WhatsApp chat in one go? Jesus knew what it, the feeling it was when people leave, when people leave because they fail to see as he sees, fail to understand as he understands, fail to apprise the principles that, that he has. Just in jest, I wrote in my notes here, Jesus has a, had a mass exodus of people from following him. In one minute, 5,000 plus people left Jesus' fish and bread WhatsApp group just because he said something doctrinally that was too hard for his followers to accept, assimilate, and apply. Do you remember also the rich young ruler left him when Jesus presented how he should sell all he has and give to the poor? The Bible says, and the rich young ruler left him. What Mark says, and Jesus loved him, but let him go. Jesus knew how not to let the disappointment of someone not meeting his expectations. You have expectations of people. And when they don't meet those expectations, you sometimes get hurt 
and allow potential bitterness to creep in. Jesus knew how to master this. Jesus knew how to let people go, but still love them. Not let people go and hate them. Not let people go and become embittered towards them. Right? He suffered betrayal at the hands of a close friend, Judas. He, his, his value, he was devalued as a person, only sold for 30 pieces of silver. The betrayal price of a common thief. Okay, And he was still gracious to Judas at that. He was denied by Peter three times. He knew the impact in his emotional state of denial by one who should have supported him. He knew the feeling of what it was to be vacated by, by one you would think would be your greatest supporter. The one you thought would support you, deserted you at the time of your greatest hour of need. Jesus knew how to handle these issues so that they don't embitter his life. He suffered ridicule, sarcasm at the hands of people. Right? They said to him on the cross, you healed others, but you, they, you can't heal yourself. You saved others, but you, you cannot save yourself. He was the, the subject of serious sarcasm, serious criticism. Isaiah 53 clearly says he was rejected and despised by men. For after his resurrection, Thomas would, you would expect to naturally believe in his resurrection and the fact that he raised from the dead as his disciple still questioned him. So Jesus had so much disappointment, so much disappointment, yet none, none of these things embittered him. And let me just say this, you and I are going to face challenges in life, you're going to face disappointment after disappointment, but none of these things must challenge you. Now, one of the gifts that Jesus got at his birth by the wise men who came to visit him was myrrh, the perfume myrrh. It's, it has a bitter taste and myrrh is some, a symbolic indication of bitterness. So why was this one of his gifts at his birth? He was about two years old when the wise men gave him this amongst a whole range of of other gifts. I believe this points prophetically to the kind of suffering that Jesus' life would be characterized by. And let me just say this, you must deal with the myrrh component in your life. That God would sometimes permit bitter herbs, bitter circumstances, even bitter people and, and life issues to potentially embitter you. And I will teach later on how this is a necessary path of your overcoming as a, as a son of God. Now, before his crucifixion, Jesus was offered sour vinegar and mixed with gall. And gall is basically a term that indicates something bitter. Okay? So before his crucifixion, they offered him sour wine mixed with this bitter gall. And you'll find this in Matthew 27, 34. They gave him the wine to drink mixed with gall. After tasting it, he was unwilling to, to drink it. After tasting it, he was unwilling to, to drink it. You'll find a prophecy related to this. I won't read it because of time in Psalm 69 from verses 22 to 21. Now, Jesus rejected sour wine mixed with bitter gall. Um, it was often given to, to those who were assigned to be crucified, crucified by death. And this was a kind of sedative to help those being crucified deal with the awful pain of a Roman crucifixion. Okay, So Jesus refused it. Jesus refused to numb his body, but he chose to fully engage the pain of the cross. So it's a prophetic sign that he was unwilling to internalize something bitter because he was unwilling to let what his father would permit him to suffer 
to embitter him. Okay, to embitter him. And he wanted to go to the full range of, of suffering so he can fully identify with human suffering in you and I that you and I must not permit to embitter us. So what you experience must not embitter you. What you suffer, either as a child or through your, your life growing up as an adult, later on in life, etc. Because life is fraught with circumstances that could potentially bruise you at Satan's hands. But you must never allow the circumstances of life to em embitter you. Now strangely enough, in Exodus 30, myrrh was one of the five ingredients of the anointing oil. One of the five ingredients of the anointing oil. And I will explain this more in the next broadcast. But I found it interesting that part of your anointing in the Holy Ghost is, will develop from your capacity to deal with severe trials that are designed by Satan to embitter you. It's through the piercings of your sufferings that God's anointing flows efficaciously and powerfully in and through your life. Now, in closing, um, I just want to encourage you that because God has raised this issue, God wants to heal you of your bitterness. God wants to heal you of any kind of residual or remnants bitterness in your and my heart. And I want you in the next few days to seriously bring this matter to the Lord in prayer. In my next broadcast, which is on Wednesday, I will take this matter further. And I want to challenge you that the things that God has permitted to afflict you were not designed to embitter you. It was the intention of Satan to allow those things to embitter you. But from God's vantage point, they were designed to empower you and to increase the levels of your anointing and the, the grace content within you. And I will demonstrate this to you in, in the coming broadcast. But I want to encourage you to just read together with me Isaiah 53 as we close from verses 3 to 7. And then simultaneously, I want to encourage you to prepare your communion em uh, e emblems, your communion uh, symbols of the wine and the bread, because these represent the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who knew no bitterness as we celebrate communion, I believe there's power and there's grace transmission in the act of celebrating the Lord's table. My prayer today is as we partake, this is the start of your deliverance, of your being set free into a new level of liberty from anything in your heart right now for which you are angry, resentful, maybe full of malice, full of unforgiveness concerning circumstances or people that God wants to heal you of. Remember Jesus by his example demonstrated you can go through a whole range of stuff and come out whole and come out well and come out being anointed with the Spirit so that you can be whole and by that same anointing heal others. So Isaiah, 40, Isaiah 53 from verses 3 to 7 says the following. He was despised and forsaken of men. This is the Lord Jesus. He was rejected. He was despised or forsaken of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus knows and knew what grief is. And like one from whom men hid their face. Verse 4, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he bore and our sorrows he carried away. He carried your sorrow. He carried your grief. He carried your bitterness. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced, his blood, he was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed. 
He was bruised for your iniquity. The chastening of our well-being fell on Him. And his, by His scourging or by His wounds, we are healed. And He died to heal not just our bodies. He died to heal the brokenness, the heartache, the bitterness even in our souls. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to be on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. But like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, he was led. All like sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. He was bruised, he was wounded, he took on your sorrow so that you do not have to be bruised, so that you do not have to suffer long protect, protracted sorrow and hurt within your heart. He took in his death on the cross, in his body, your and my sin. And in the cross there is not only forgiveness of sin, in the cross there is great healing for the bruising of your soul and yours and my bitterness. Will you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? As you bow, there is a verse in Proverbs 14 verse 10a which says, Only the heart knows its own bitterness. Again, I want to challenge the entire church. Don't sit there and say I'm not bitter. Because this scripture says, Proverbs 14.10, only the heart knows. You know, we can pretend and appear to be whole, happy. We can appear that we have it all together when men look at us. Because many are so good at facading or presenting a facade. I'm also trust, I'm, I'm bringing my life before God and I'm saying to my father, let this today be the start of a cleanup in my soul. Any, re, any residual trace of Egyptian bitterness that's been inflicted in my life through disappointments of circumstances, disappointments of people, or trials and afflictions that God has permitted, Insteading, instead of the trial making you bitter, it must make you better and i say to you that as we celebrate communion that in the in the remembrance of christ and what he done for you and i on the cross that in the that in the partaking of these emblems great grace will be imparted to you and i today in the name of the lord jesus let's pray together father i just want to thank you for this word i bring my life bring my family's life, I bring the church and everyone represent, and all those viewing today before you, we humbly present our souls to you. God, if there's any trace of bitterness, I ask supernaturally, by the anointing of your Holy Spirit, heal us. Right now, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would go and touch people in their hearts, and heal the bruising of Satan where he's inflicted bitterness, where there's anger with people, where there's unforgiveness, may we just release them and forgive now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Where there's animosity, where there's malice or, or malicious intent to another, please, Father, forgive us. Where there's hatred, where there's always a misunderstanding of another's intentions, motives, forgive us, heal any kind of expression of bitterness within us, Father, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus. We know that you will not only heal us, you will set us free. And Father, I speak liberty to everyone that is, that is listening. I ask even in the, the, the current global crisis, that we will emerge from this whole people 
We pray the prayer of David, restore our souls. Help us to have a whole, healthy soul. Our mindsets, the content of our emotions, totally free, totally at liberty, totally free to explore all of your principles, your person, your promises, your purposes in our lives. So I declare wholeness. I declare healing. I declare wellness to the church. I declare by your authority today, Father, that we are healed by the power of the blood of Christ, by the, by the body which was broken for us through his, through his pain on the cross. He took our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By your stripes we are healed, body, soul, and spirit today. I affirm this for myself and for the entirety of of our viewership today, in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Shall we partake? Amen. Amen. While well, I pray this, this message has been challenging to you as much as it has been to my own life, I'm committing to never allow my soul to ever be embittered. And I want to encourage you, you can live a bitter proof life. And I would like to encourage you to join me again on Wednesday. Um, the video will be released from about 8 a.m. And you can watch it at any time in the course of the day on Wednesday. I want to encourage you to track this theme with me. Remember what we are doing. We are leaving Egypt. And the bitter herbs in the meal of the Passover remind us that while we will face difficult people, difficult circumstances, that none of these things must cause us to entertain bitterness within our hearts, but to be totally free from this so that we can explore the will of the Lord for our lives more powerfully. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause His face to shine upon you. And may the Lord give you His peace. Bye-bye. God bless you. Amen.